um, I was on a show called Canadian Idol when I was 16 and I made it pretty far. It's kind of like an X Factor type show based off actually the first British, the first ever, you know, vocal talent show on TV was a British show called Pop Stars. And so American Idol and Canadian Idol and all the subsequent, you know, Singapore Idols and what have you were modeled after the UK show Pop Stars. And then later on came X Factor and The Voice and what have you. So I was on this Canadian Idol show and, you know, I'd always wanted to be a singer. I'd always wanted to be like on the radio and and get to write songs and, and live that whole sort of pop star lifestyle. And so I, I auditioned for this show. I made it pretty far. And then the Simon Cowell type judge, I think his name was Zach Warner. He was like, you're too theatrical, get out. <laughs> and I did like the walk of shame. Um, and then the host of the show was a guy named, um, what was it, Brian Mul- Ben Mulrooney. So he was a famous Canadian politician's son who was hired as kind of like the MC of the whole thing. And so um, it was an interesting experience because at that time in the Canadian music industry, there was really only like Nickelback um, and Avril Lavigne. And mm-hmm. there wasn't really room for like a, um, maybe a more theatrical pop singer. You know, I was kind of I was, you know, dyeing my hair black and I had like black nail polish and kind of doing more of like a kind of like a punk rock kind of thing. And I don't think that that was really what the Canadian music industry was looking for at the time. So they're like, you would actually do a lot better if you, you know, you're very theatrical. Maybe you should do like Broadway or something. Mm -hmm. And so I had auditioned for a musical theater school in New York City around the same time I was on Idol, and I actually won a scholarship to go to New York and study for two years at a conservatory called the American Musical and Dramatic Academy. And um, that was where I first discovered spirituality because one of our acting teachers was a yoga teacher, and he would make us teach each other yoga sequences, and he was a certified yoga teacher, so he's big into yoga. He's like, if you you know, do yoga before you go on stage as an actor or a singer or a dancer, you're gonna be more present, you're going to be more in your body, you're going to be more focused, and you're going to be a better listener as an actor. And I started to fall more in love with the yoga than the acting. I didn't like all the cattle call auditions in New York. You know, I'd make it to like the top three out of 400 dudes in a cattle call multi-day audition for like the role of Gaston on the Disney Cruise Line. <laughs> and then I would get, you know, booted for, oh, you you don't have enough weight on you, or you're too fat, or you're too this. Or, and I just didn't like having my fate being in the ca- the hands of these casting directors in New York. And so, did and so that, I kind of, yeah, so go ahead. That, did that transition very quickly or was it that over, were you still after the sort of pop star life to begin with and then the spirituality came into it or was it a, an instant thing as soon as you are exposed it was kind of over the course of about a year like it was getting colder in new york i was getting more sort of discouraged um and i i started to realize that it just feels so good to feel good in your body and the yoga was making me feel so good in my body i was like oh well maybe maybe i should shift my focus from being like wanting to be a pop star to teaching yoga and so I moved back to Vancouver um, after two years at that school. And I, I actually won a singing competition in Vancouver. And I won exactly the amount of money that I needed at the time. That was in 2008. It was 20, I think it was 2,500 bucks, um, which was almost exactly the cost of the yoga teacher training in Vancouver at the time. So I put the money that I won from the singing competition to becoming a yoga teacher. And I just started teaching yoga now, the interesting thing is the teaching panel of instructors for that that course, it was like, you know, a Yoga Alliance certified course. One of them was Alanis Morissette's twin brother, <laughs> and his name is Wade Imray Morissette. And so he was combining pop music with Sanskrit mantras, and it was very catchy, very poppy. And I was like, oh my gosh, this, this is lighting me up to listen to this dude's music. So I asked him one day after class, I was like, how, like, I, I want to do what you do. How, like, do you have any wisdom for me? He's like, just do it. Just start writing songs and take your favorite Sanskrit mantras and put them in the chorus and you're good to go. And so I started to do that. And then through a sort of fortitious connection on Facebook, I hooked up with his drummer and producer and I spoke with him and his name is Mike Southworth. And he, he was um, down to work with me. So long story short, I had written all these songs. I'd been writing songs since I was like 12, but they were all English and I don't think they were very good. 
But then I realized if I took out some of the English, especially in the choruses, and then injected in a really high frequency mantra, you know, a 35,000 year old mantra that it would do something to the song. And mm -hmm. I liked to sing them more. People like to listen to them more. And the record label started to take interest. And I ended up um, getting a record deal with a record label here in Canada. They're a subsidiary of Sony Music International. They're called Network, N-E-T-T-W-E-R-K. Yeah. And um, the CEO of Network um, had actually been coming to my yoga classes. His name's Terry McBride. And uh, I was shopping my, my demo CD to him. And long story short, he ended up signing me to his label. And he thought that I would do better in, in places like Japan because I'm very theatrical. And he was actually hesitant to sign me at first. He actually said, well, your music is a little too theatrical for our record label, but I'm willing to give you a chance. So I signed with Network in 2011. I released my, my album and it hit number one on the iTunes World Music Chart two times. Mm -hmm. And um, that was when I realized that it like you don't actually even really need a record label because of the internet. And I was doing so much of the work on my own that I started to self release my subsequent albums. And I started to tour in Japan and I, I worked through the yoga community in Asia to get some notoriety. And I was on some, you know, mainstream pop radio stations only in Japan would they play a half Sanskrit pop song on mainstream radio. They would never do that in North America. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it, that's kind of like my story in a nutshell in, in terms of the musical aspect of it. There's a lot of um, fate in it, the, the sort of the, the money being the right amount, the record mm -hmm. label guy being in your yoga classes. Is that something you believe in? Or do you think that was just all coincidental? I think the, yeah, I think the better you feel in your body, the more things line up. That's what I've started to realize. And I think that was the missing piece when I was on Idol. I remember I wasn't even in my body. I was like so nervous because there's a bunch of, I don't know if you know how these TV talent shows work, but there's like four or five pre television rounds where the producers of the show will vet you and they'll get like a certain number of good singers and a certain number of really bad singers to put on the actual TV judge round so that it's an interesting show and they can have really, really good people and really, really bad people in terms of like, you know, sort of like novelty acts and what have you. And so the, the yoga started to make me feel better in my body. And that's when I felt that things started to line up. And as you say, fate, like, it's just like, I really honestly believe the better you feel in your body and the more juicy and grounded you feel in your body and the here and now as you are, the more good opportunities come to you. Yeah. And did, did you say you were only 16 when you were on um, Canadian Idol? Yeah, I was 16. Yeah. Were you ready for the experience or do you think it was quite overwhelming at that age? It was very overwhelming. Yeah, I didn't have very many tools to like, to sort of stay calm and to, you know, be in my body and be in my breath. I was a very anxious kid. I was bullied a lot. I was, you know, when I moved to New York, I was actually chased up the street by a guy with a switchblade calling me and this guy that I was dating. We were holding hands. So the first time we ever held hands, it was in Hell's Kitchen. We'd just been to Dallas Barbecue, which is like a, an American barbecue change. And I reached out to hold his hand. It was raining in Hell's Kitchen. And then this guy with a switchblade is like, you fucking faggots, I'm going to get you. And then we started to run and he chased us. We got into a taxi and zoomed off. Um, but I did you know, I had a lot, that was the worst. That was the most intense, but throughout my entire high school, I was the only boy in choir. And I had a lot of experiences where people were, you know, drawing cocks in my mouth on my student council posters, or I'd be training for long distance cross country around West Vancouver, where I lived, like around the streets. And then these dudes would like drive by in like a Hummer and shout faggot at me and like throw like, um, half, half eaten food at me. And they'd egg my family's house and they'd slash my tires and it just was really intense. And it wasn't necessarily that I was gay. It was more that I was the only boy in choir and I was very sort of out there. Like I was a student council president and I was very, I perform at the school assemblies. And so, um, yeah, I just didn't have the tools. I didn't have the sort of the sense of self-approval and self-acceptance to realize that none of that stuff was about me. You know, there's nothing wrong with being different, but at the time it was not cool to be different, especially if you're a dude. Um, you know, back in the nineties, um, I mean, still in places like Iran, you know, if, if you're considered to be too effeminate, you will literally be hung in a city square. Like it's like still pretty bad in certain countries. Um, 
Yeah. So that's, that's another reason why I like yoga so much is it's this daily practice of like coming back into your body and feeling safe and learning how to breathe, staying in that parasympathetic nervous system state. And then from that place, you're in this pillar of support and protection from above and below. And then you can take more chances and you don't take criticism as personally, nor do you take praise as personally. That's what I'm realizing because praise can really inflate us. Criticism and, and these types of negative experiences with people can really deflate us. So, you know, the, the Bhagavad Gita says yoga is the practice of tolerating the consequences of being yourself. And it's about maintaining equanimity regardless of praise or criticism, victory or defeat, that sort of, you know, how do mentality. You, how do you deal with that in terms of now that your, your profile is sort of building? Is that, is you, does pride get in the way of it at all? Or are you managing to, to stay on a level playing field still? I think I'm, I think I'm doing okay. Like for being, for being a highly sensitive person, I think I'm doing okay. Um, sometimes like the nasty comments kind of sometimes get to me. Like I have to be mindful. Like I can't go onto social media before I do my morning routine. That's what I realize is like, I have to do my breath work, you know, my sexual Kung Fu practice, nourish myself kind of like, and then set my intentions for the day. And then I can start to go onto social media because sometimes you get really, really great comments and sometimes you get really, really nasty comments. Um, yeah, so I think, I, I, think I, I'll, I will continue to do okay with that as long as I maintain my good daily habits uh, that keep me in my highest. And of course, nobody's perfect. And sometimes I let the criticism get to me. And then other times, maybe I let the praise get to me. I think I'm, I think I'm doing okay with that so far. Knock on wood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why, why do you think it's like that these days? For instance, I know be, long before this article is published that when it is published, there'll be nasty comments, probably, probably about both of us will. And why, mm -hmm. why is there so much sort of aggression online? I think that there's a lot of imbalance in our culture. Um, I think that people have a lot of anger. I feel like modern humans are almost like caged animals. We kind of like, I, I think of those like poor chickens, you know, those non free range chickens that live their lives in battery cages. And I feel like a lot of, a lot of us humans feel like that. We've been domesticated and caged. And, you know, in the case of my American clients, circumcised, sexually abused, there's so much uh, trauma. And I think that when you're behind a keyboard, sometimes that trauma can be directed at people who are, public figures. Um, I think that's at least part of it. And there's also the dominator system has this intention to kind of divide and conquer. So there's all these, you know, there's left versus right, there's gay versus straight, there's, you know, there's all these divisions that I think um, are being sort of promoted by the mainstream media. And I don't want to get too conspiratorial, but there does seem to be a lot of divide and control tactics um, in our society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and obviously you are able to sort of rise above it all with your spirituality now. Have you always been spiritually inclined? And obviously you said it was a big uh, moment when you moved to New York, but even going way back, do you think you had a, a sort of natural bent towards it? Or Well, I like knowing that like in ancient cultures, according to a lot of research I've done, I studied psychology and anthropology at UBC, and it's like sexuality was invariably tied and inextricably bound to spiritual practice in ancient cultures mm. and then sort of for example in india a lot of yoga was tantric yoga where they were you know wrapping their cocks around poles and you know other dudes were standing on the poles to like strengthen their dicks and you know symbolize their devotion to god they're doing all these erotic practices you know or, or a woman would sit on top of a man and you know they the man would insert his lingam into her yoni and they would do sort of energetic breathwork practices like it was very juicy and sexy um, as a way of connecting to the divine. And then when the British came, no offense, <laughs> and then the, the Mughals, it was kind of like a double whammy in India. When the British and Mughals infiltrated India, they imparted their sort of sexual Victorian shame onto the country, into the practices. And now we're left when you go to India now, it's like you have to be fully clothed. There's very little Tantra yoga over there, although it is starting to, to experience a reemergence. Um, but um, what, sorry, what was your question again? Uh, no, I think it, I was just saying, have you always been oh, have I, right. from, from an early age yourself? Yes. Okay. So I have these memories, like now I teach mostly sexual Kung Fu and I have these memories of like hitting puberty and then kind of doing 
like what I do now, like sort of elements of sexual Kung Fu and having full body orgasms and feeling connected to the divine the moment I hit puberty. And of course, there's no context for that in Western culture. So I'm like, am I weird? Is this, is this weird to like be <laughs> practicing having non-ejaculatory orgasms and feeling connected to God? Um, but then I realized it's an ancient Taoist practice and Kung Fu just means daily discipline. So sexual Kung Fu is the daily spiritual discipline of um, harnessing and directing your life force, AKA your sexual energy uh, to better be able to be connected to the whole, like yoga means union. So it's not only a union with yourself, but also a union with the divine uh, or God or whatever you want to call it. And so I think I've always had that, albeit it was quite suppressed for a while. Yeah, and you were mentioning there your daily routines and ones from history. Do you engage in any tantric practices yourself? Yeah, yeah, I've got um, a tantra partner, Naomi, and she's a, a tantra teacher, and she's taught me a lot of sort of the partners and, and couples uh, tantric exercises. There's one that I really love, the Yabyum practice that I alluded to prior. And um, yeah, and I ended up studying with Montauk Chia, who's kind of my main teacher now, uh, as well as a senior universal healing Tao teacher named Lauren Johnson. And um, I'm actually taking another course with Montauk Chia right now online. And I'm always like, I'm just so passionate about this because it's helped me break free of addiction. That's kind of another element of my story is I, I was like doing the whole pop star thing and then I got addicted to alcohol and, and uh, cocaine. And it was really this. How old this, were you then, Will, sorry? How old were yeah, you then? I was, I remember I was at a party and somebody offered me cocaine. It was probably 2013. So from 2013, so I would have been, I was 25 in 2010, 20, so probably 28 or so. Mm. I'm 37 now. So from age sort of 28 to 33 or 34, I got into drugs and alcohol. And, um, that was when I was just teaching hot yoga and half a, like stretchy, stretchy Lululemon style yoga. And that's great for some things. Like it's good, good for a bit of stress reduction and more flexibility, obviously. But there was something missing from my practice. Like you can do all the downward dogs in the world, but if you've got sexual shame, it's not going to really help to heal that. And so I started to, you know, do more research on different styles of yoga. And that's when I found, you know, Taoist esoteric yoga, sexual Kung Fu, which actually directly addresses sexual energy as well as breath work. There's a, a teacher up here named Edward Dangerfield, uh, who was trained by a guy named Robin Clements in the breath wave lineage. And that's basically, it's called conscious connected breathing. It's a form of like transformational breath or like other people call it like shamanic breath work or, um, yeah, I mean, basically you just lie on the ground, you just feel your body and you just go, <sighs> so it's like an active inhale, passive exhale. <sighs> and you breathe so deeply that like your cock balls and prostate bulge, like you're breathing down into your roots because a lot of dudes are disconnected from their roots. And then sometimes because our issues are in our tissues, shame will come up, pain will come up, um, you know, different types of emotions will come up and you're encouraged to stay out of story and just feel it to heal it. It's like somebody said, if you want to feel better, you've got to get better at feeling. So it was the combination of the sexual Kung Fu, also a lineage called Kundalini Yoga that I studied in India in 2018 uh, and breath work that helped me break free of the addiction to drugs and alcohol. Uh, which is why I'm so passionate about it now. Also mantra music, because the, the frequency of mantra music is, especially if you chant it, like you can do like a bunch of things. Like this is a 528 hertz tuning fork, which is supposed to be like the heart chakra frequency or the vibration of love. And so if you chant a mantra, like a high vibe mantra, like Om, at 528, you're getting like the, the juicy benefit of the mantra also with the high frequency tones. So I was like, oh, and you just feel that peace. And yep. I think that a lot of people, myself included, who were getting addicted to drugs and alcohol, it's because we didn't know how to get high naturally. Mm -hmm. And so what I realized in my journey is I'll always be an addict. So for me, it's about getting addicted to right to the right things. Mm. So I subbed out cocaine for Kundalini yoga. You know, I subbed out alcohol for chanting and mantra uh, and long distance running. You know, I've run a bunch of marathons. Actually, my mom and I ran the Loch Ness Marathon in Scotland a couple of years ago, and that was really fun. And since then, I've run another two marathons. And that that's another way to get high on your own supply. 
And so that's, that's kind of my MO these days is like substituting bad addictions with better addictions. Yeah. Obviously not everyone in society has um, addictions, but one thing you were saying there was sexual shame. Does that mm-hmm. come personally for you or is that something that's just imbued in you from society or did, do you have a kickstart point for that? I think that sexual shaming is one of the most upstream ways that the matrix cuts humans in general off from our power. You know, if they can cut us off from our sexual energy, you know, from the part of our body that makes us wild and free and the part of our being that makes us wild and free, then they don't have to put a literal cage around us. And I don't think it's necessarily conspiratorial. It's just predatory capitalism. You know, a a society full of really healthy, juicy humans who are free of sexual shame is less easy to control and to sell products to, for example, if you can, if you can make somebody feel really unsexy and say, Hey, if you buy this product, you're going to feel sexy. (laughs) It's just a really great way for the predatory capitalistic structure to continue itself. Um, so personally, you know, I think that, I mean, I remember being sexually abused by a doctor when I was four and, and that was, that's an epidemic. Like that's one of the true epidemics of our society is so many young people are sexually abused in different ways. Um, and it's, and it's so shameful that people don't really talk about it. And, um, again, it it comes back to these good daily habits and the breath work and just giving ourselves permission to talk about it because when you shine a light on it, then it starts to dissipate and transform into something more life-giving shame can't survive in the light. Yeah. Which is why I'm, I often do my work naked. You know, that's another thing I think, um, the idea that we have to always be wearing clothes is another way that the matrix kind of cuts us off from our juiciness and our, our full power. You know, I found when I, when I do the naked training, then even when I put my clothes back on, I feel more confident. There's something about nudity that I think is, is a powerful way to, to train the body, mind and soul back into its wild and shame-free state. Yeah. Don't, don't worry. Well, I would have had me jump off as well, but it's a bit freezing in here. So. Oh, no, sorry, no worries. <laughs> yeah. This cost of living crisis is affecting the heat and well. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Uh, but what you're, what you're saying there, obviously, you, you're doing some great work and uh, a lot of people are benefiting from it. Um, do you think you. anyone would, do you think you could ever be back on uh, sort of a Canadian island or do you think they wouldn't, them types of shows wouldn't have someone like you on now? That's a good question. I was thinking about that recently. I don't think they would allow me back on because of the sort of extreme X-rated nature of my teachings. Most uh, sexual Kung Fu teachers don't teach naked. Montauk Chia never teaches naked. Uh, One other teacher I know does teach naked, my teacher, Lauren Johnson. So kudos to him for paving the way. But most people don't. And so I don't know if you ever heard of Frenchie Davis. She was on one of the first few seasons of American Idol. Mm -hmm. And she made it really far. I think she was set to win the whole competition. And then it surfaced online that she had some naked pictures up and they, they disqualified her from the competition just because of some naked pictures. Um, and that was really, that was really upsetting. I ended up actually seeing her on Broadway. She was uh, in some Broadway shows later on. So that was great to see, but yeah, I don't think even in 2022, I think the work that I do is too edgy to allow me to do anything sort of mainstream. The interesting thing is because of the internet, the the divinage, the divide between mainstream and fringe is is kind of dissipating. For example, I was on this show called Channel Five News um, with Andrew Callahan, and they've got millions and millions and millions of followers, and their stuff is very very fringe. Um, so now, like, I'll go for I'll be like for a hike in the woods, and then some random dude and his girlfriend is like, "Oh my god, can I get a picture with you? You're like that wild naked dude. <laughs> uh, we're having a viewing party. We're gonna watch the uncensored version on on Andrew's Patreon tonight." Like, I, I keep getting people running into me in random places like that, and it's really cool. Um, so that the line between, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is, there's other ways to get your work out and your 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 message and your your talent and your art out to the world. And I just think that um, more fringe approaches are the best for me now because of the nature of my work um, versus like a mainstream show like, uh, can, I mean, Canadian I was canceled. They still have actually the voice in Canada, but you have to be francophone. I think it's only for residents of Quebec, interestingly enough. Yeah, well, what you're saying there is, is bang on about the, the divide between the mainstream and fringes now. There's some YouTube stars who a lot of people wouldn't have heard of but they've got like a billion views and stuff and it's it's crazy the big divide now so i'm, I'm sure right. you can um you will be able to push on through other means no doubt about that 
Thank you. Yeah, the censorship is crazy. Like I've been deleted from Instagram, for example, 10 times. I've been deleted from YouTube two times, constantly in Facebook jail. Um, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to not get censored, but it seems like because I speak about medical freedom and then sexuality, it's kind of like a double whammy in terms of the censorship. Is that what uh, you, get, you get blocked for? Is it just speaking out or it's not, it's not nudity or anything? No, like I, I never show nudity on social media except for Twitter because Twitter's terms of service and community guidelines permit nudity. But obviously Facebook and Instagram doesn't. YouTube is a bit dicey because they produce, they allow um, educational nudity. So I thought that a naked yoga training would be fine, but then they blocked my, they deleted my entire 13 years of work for like a, na a educational naked yoga video. I'm like, there's tons of naked yoga stuff on YouTube. Anyway, that was weird. Mm -hmm. um, but it's usually that. That was the first time. The second time my YouTube got deleted was because I had a fellow on my podcast and I uploaded the video version of the podcast onto YouTube. And within 10 minutes, it was gone. And then my entire channel was deleted. And they said that I had violated community guidelines around medical misinformation. I had a fellow named Alex Zek on my show. And he speaks out about sort of the, you know, um, the downside of certain pharmaceutical products that are being uh, pushed to the masses right now. Um, so, yeah, those are usually the two things I get censored for most. Medical freedom information, uh, or as the dominator system would call it, disinformation. Um, and then sort of um, tantric teachings. Yeah. And so just one final question there for you, Will, is um, it's, a very, it's a difficult one to answer, but do you think you'd be where you are now without um, the Canadian Idol? Do you think, or do you think a large part of the spirituality is a response to that, or is it just a, a natural thing that you really enjoy and you, you think you would have gotten into anyway? I think that that's a really good question. I think that that as painful as that was, like as sort of uncomfortable as that was to kind of be shamed by the judges and, and do the walk of shame. And it was really good because it was contrast and it was like, it, it realigned my purpose. It, it forced me to find a deeper reason as to why I wanted to be a singer before Canadian Idol. I thought, well, I want to be a famous singer and I didn't really feel that good in my body. And so then it, it kind of flipped it where it's like, oh, if I actually just feel really juicy in my body, then opportunities just come to me. And the intention behind performing is less about wanting to be famous and more about just feeling juicy in my own skin and wanting to share that feeling of joy that, that for example, ma chanting mantras gives me with others. Um, yeah. And you just feel more creative. You feel more, you, you feel the way you actually think you're going to feel when you quote unquote become famous or when you win the million dollars or whatever. If you can generate that feeling now in the here and now, then the universe starts to correspond to the nature of your song. So yeah, I'm really grateful for that experience in, of being kicked off idol because it kind of taught me, it, it pushed me into the yogic lineages of feeling juicy in your own skin and then that's when the record deals come. That's when the money comes is when you feel, when you're actually feeling the feelings that you think you're going to feel once you get what you want. If you can generate it now, that seems, in my experience, that seems to actually cause you to get what you want more, yeah. more often than not. And then if you never get what you want, say you want to manifest a beautiful lover, if you can do sexual Kung Fu in a way where you learn how to make love to yourself, then it doesn't really matter if the lover ever comes because now you know how to generate the feeling. It's like the person was just the prop. If you know how to actually give yourself multiple orgasms, then you kind of become more and more stubborn. Then yeah. it doesn't really ever matter because you're like, I feel really good now. <laughs> it doesn't matter if the girl or the guy ever comes. Do you have a lover right now, Will, or not? No, yeah, I'm, I've been single. I've been pretty much celibate for like a year and a half deliberately because I wanted to really dive deeply into these teachings. And my teacher, Montauk Chia, says, before you do the more advanced practice of what he calls dual cultivation, so sex with another, it's good to have a practice, you know, for a long time of single cultivation or soul, we call it solo cultivation in Taoism, where you basically learn how to make love to yourself and master your own sexual energy. So you become more sovereign in, in the realm of eroticism. And then you can enter the more, he calls it the more advanced practice of dual cultivation. So I'm, pr I'm still in the solo cultivation phase. <laughs> yeah. But, but would you go into that? Are you just, you're just happy being, or do you want to go into dual cultivation? 
I think eventually, yeah, when the, when the right sort of partner comes along, like I have Tantra, like, as I was saying before, I've got like a Tantra partner. We don't do full on sex, but we do like certain yab yum techniques where we do like non-penetrative sexual energy practices. And also, um, a lot of my work is, is about bringing dudes out into nature and we get naked and we like hug naked with our cocks touching. And we, you know, we do what we call the wild man activation where we like growl and we kind of like turn into wild stags or like minotaurs and, um, we really access that kind of wild erotic prowess that I believe my Celtic ancestors were doing when they were worshiping the half man, half deer fertility God of Kernunos, for example, or the green man. Mm. Um, so I, I really love that sort of wild and, and free, uh, practice with, with my, my male friends as well. So I do get erotic satisfaction and training apart from just by myself in those types of contexts where I'm like with my friends, you know, shaking our cocks and balls. There is an erotic undercurrent in, in those types of rituals. Um, but in terms of like, you know, full on sex, um, I feel like I'm almost ready to invite that back into my life for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the practices you speak of there, do you think, every single person would benefit from these i do you think you have to be a specific person i just think it's just a, a universal thing if you let yourself go enough well it's interesting when the when the white colonialists came for example over to north america from britain um and even this the spanish um colonialists as well i've been reading their travel logs like their journals when they were when they were first arriving and they would say things like these dirty you know these savages are very dirty uh, you know, the, the, the men are, um, you know, doing, they're having sex with other men. This is not good. You know, we need to Christianize them. We need to, you know, teach them the correct way to live. Um, the French colonizers, when they came to Canada, they saw the first nations men. There were certain men in each tribe who they called berdash, which is a French word meaning like slut or prostitute. And these were men who were were very good at being men and also very good at being women. And these were kind of like the witch doctors or the healers or the shamans of their little of their tribes. And they would be really good mediators between men and women of the tribe, as well as between the earth plane and the spiritual planes. And so the French colonizers shamed them and actually killed them off first because they were scared of them, probably. And they saw that they had power and they wanted to take that sort of spiritual leader out from the First Nations people's tribes. So I think that this sort of Judeo-Christian lineage, the Victorian kind of lineage that much of the world has fallen prey to has deliberately, as I said before, cut us off from that wild and free erotic kind of nature that I think is is at the very heart of, of who human beings are. We are designed to be erotic and juicy beings. Um, and so I, I don't want to say that this work is for everybody. But I do want to say that I think had the colonizers not won, like say there had been like, maybe the, the, the white people came over and then they like, instead of killing all the two spirit shamans, they like took the best of the best of like British culture and the best of the best of Canadian First Nations tribes and like amalgamated it, you know, and came together. I think that there'd be a lot more people open to the work that I'm sharing uh, versus this sort of dominator system, white, colonized, anti-sex, shameful kind of mentality that's promulgated the world. Yeah. And and for people who are interested in, in seeing your stuff before we go, where, where can they find you? Will? Yeah. Um, probably the, because I keep getting deleted from Instagram. Probably the, it, um, at, what's it called? Uh, Twitter is probably the best, but just be forewarned, it is not safe for work content. <laughs> um, my handle on Twitter is W Blunderfield. Yeah. And then for my medical freedom stuff, Telegram allows medical freedom discussions. So that is also uh, t.me slash W Blunderfield. And then for everything else, just head over to willblunderfield.ca. And that's got my podcast and um, my superfood stuff. And um, I kind of have like a holy trinity of technologies that I use to help men rewild themselves and come back into their erotic prowess. And that's sexual kung fu, also known as sexual transmutation, semen retention, and superfoods. So you can find all of that over at willblunderfield.ca.